Good day. So good to be here with you. Um, this is a, a Saturday, day before Sunday. I pray and hope that you've had a blessed, uh, blessed uh, week or so since we've seen each other. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me into your places. I'm thinking about the, the March the 19th tomorrow as we get closer and closer to Easter. I'm not sure what you're planning on doing during the Easter season, but I hope you've spent some time uh, contemplating and praying and reading the Bible um, and preparing yourself to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there was a time long ago when people would look to the vertical for answers to their questions. That there was a divine being beyond all that can be seen or known. That the events in our lives, whatever they were, positive, negative, or neutral, were understood in the will and purpose of a divine being. Then came the period known as the Enlightenment, a period that began in the middle of the 17th century and spanned about 150 years. A period that had a large impact on the uh, Western culture, primarily in the fields of politics, science, and philosophy, and this would spill into religion as well. And the focus moved from the vertical to the horizontal, and the answers to the important questions of life could be found in what could be observed around us. And the questions that had been settled for centuries were all up for debate in this new age of enlightenment. For example, the worldview grounded in the Bible and Christianity was rejected by many of the enlightened culture. For one could only believe what was observable in the horizontal. Let's fast forward now to our time, to the 21st century, and the impact of the enlightenment continues to pervade our culture today. The modern enlightened mind of today would understand that belie and believe that truth is primarily subjective, not objective. The truth changes as new data is discovered and added with what is already known. And even some is thrown out as old-fashioned. And then the application of truth is subjectively applied to the individual experience of life. Truth has a new and supposedly improved defini definition. And it goes something like this. Truth is what the individual desires. What is true for me may not be true for you. But that is of no consequence, for I am the one who decides what is best for me. And you can't tell me otherwise. Our enlightened culture laughs at the Christian who decides to serve God. To submit to God is seen as dumb and often is received as an affront to the modern, educated and sophisticated person. You see, to be a free person means one mustn't submit and serve God who demands obedience to his commands. After all, in the mind of the modern person, there is no empirical data to support that God even exists. So friends, as we consider the tension between the enlightened 21st century culture and Christianity, we find in the Bible that it points us to true enlightenment and the freedom that can only be found in Christ. As someone once said, quote, the gospel frees us to abandon fear and self-righteousness. We carry the message of reconciliation we get to join the mission of God. We get to marvel as God shines his light into the darkness of lost hearts. And just like he did our own. End of quote. Well, please turn in your Bibles to chapter 5 of Galatians. We continue in our sermon series, Galatians for Freedom. And we're going to be reading together the first 15 verses of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await, eagerly wait, pardon me, for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Verse 7. You were running well. 
who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion is not for him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, uh, as we spend some time here in Galatians chapter 5, we ask that you would, by your spirit, guide us through this. That you would challenge us in the places that need to be challenged, that need to be changed. Help us to think clearly, think biblically, and also allow our emotions to be part of that process. We're not segregated people. We are one whole person. You created us that way. And Lord, it tells us here in Galatians chapter 5 that you've called us for freedom. And often we think of freedom in ways that are not biblical and not good for us. And I pray that you would also shine your magnifying glass on those areas and that we would repent and turn to you and ask for forgiveness. Oh, Lord, that you would fill us each day with your spirit, that we would bring great honor and glory to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue today where the Apostle Paul left off at the end of chapter 4. And keeping in mind that Paul's letter would have had no chapter or or verse breaks, uh, we can best understand verse uh, 1 here in chapter 5 as a continuation of Paul's thinking from Paul 4. From Paul (laughs) 4. Ah, sounds like we're going to have fun today. From chapter 4. Uh, there's a couple of things he did in chapter 4, but for sure Paul corrected, was correcting an incorrect usage of the Abrahamic covenant, which we covered last week. And the heart of the matter is this. The Galatians had been redeemed by placing their trust in the crucified Christ and consequently were adopted as sons and daughters of God. Or as he put it at the end of chapter 4, the Galatians were children of the free woman, born of grace, and not the slave woman whose children are born of the flesh and are slaves. So now as we look at chapter 5, verse 1, we see that it was for freedom that Christ has set even Paul and the Galatians free, and all Christians today free. As we quickly look at verse 1, the apostles' appeal here can be seen in, in two parts. And the first part, I already just mentioned, reminds the Galatians that it was Christ who set them free. Or as he said here in verse 13 of uh, chapter 5, for you were called to freedom. You know, folks, when we think about this, you know, Christ doesn't come into our lives um, because he, he needs something from us. Christ doesn't need anything from us. He is God. Christ doesn't come into our lives so that he can make some adjustments in us, you know, sort of tune us up a bit and and send us on our merry way. No. He comes into our lives to set us free. Free from and free to. Free from and free to. Free from the law and his condemnation and the judgment to come and free to love God, free to love others and serve others. The second part, since Christ went to the lengths he did for our freedom, We are to stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul had already said to the Galatians earlier in the letter, chapter 3, verse 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Holy Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, how dumb can you be? Why do you want to go back to the graveyard and hang out with the dead ones? No, don't do that. Stand firm in your freedom that Christ has called you to. Stand firm like William Wallace, as portrayed by Mel Gibson in the 1995 movie Braveheart. When facing the large English army in the battlefield, he said to the Scots, 
they'll, they'll never take our freedom. Stand firm like that. As we move now from, to verse 2 and through the rest of these verses, we see that Paul lays out for us six negatives in the letter. That is, six negative consequences of adopting the false teaching that was being presented as a viable option to live a godly life before a holy and just God. This was another gospel that Paul had already said was no gospel at all. And we see the first negative consequence here in verse 2. And when we consider the context, it was more than likely that some of the male Galatians had submitted themselves, had submitted themselves to circumcision. And just as we know that some, at the very least, had decided to follow the Mosaic calendar as described for us here in this letter in chapter 4, verse 10. So it's no wonder that Paul stated uh, at verse 9 a common first century proverb, proverb where he said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The false message of the Judaizers was spreading through the, through the churches. So Paul said here, verse 2 to them, Look, if you accept circumcision, here's the first negative consequence. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Well, how so, Paul? Well, interesting enough, the answer is found in the very next verse, in verse 3. And there is also found the second negative consequence. So we have answer and the second negative consequence. Please read verse 3 with me. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is, here's the second negative consequence, and the answer to our question, he is obligated to keep the whole law. And now think about this. Before Christ, the Galatians had been slaves to their pagan gods and cultures, and, and not only spiritually, but in so many other ways. Then Christ shows up through Paul's preaching and calls them to freedom. They accept that invitation and place their faith, faith in the finished work of Christ crucified. So what advantage would it have been to take on the law? What advantage would there be in that? Paul has said to the Roman church this, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. We go back to chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 10. There Paul said this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. All the things and do them. You know, I want to bring this a little closer to home and ask you this question. Are you relying on anything other than Christ for your salvation and your life in faith? I found an interesting article pondering, pondering uh, this thing, this thought, how it seems so easy for us to get to the place where we give lip service to Christ, but our attitudes and our actions reveals a divided heart, or really a legalistic heart. And the author asks his readers a probing question. Let me share that with you. Do you elevate to the status of moral law something that the Bible does not require? And he gives an example. Yes, the Bible commands the weekly gatherings for prayer, Bible study, worship, and the participation in communion and baptism. But the legalistic heart condemns any who for any reason miss a, miss, miss a worship service. Chooses to mow the lawn after church, etc., etc. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't go to church often. I'm just saying what he's saying. The legalistic heart condemns any who for any reason miss a worship service. Or like I do sometimes, I like to go cut the grass in the afternoon. The legalistic heart is always looking for what's wrong in other people's lives to judge them instead of looking for what's right to encourage them. And we all know, at least we know inside our own hearts, that none of us gets everything right all the time. 
Yet the legalistic heart lives to identify the wrongs in another person. And these folks think of themselves as more superior, more spiritual, more favored and loved by God. And consequently, the, and ultimately they refuse to acknowledge their own faults and failures, which are often obvious. So what's behind all this? Well, it's the belief that one's own efforts and achievements merit acceptance with God and approval from people. And friends, this is where the Galatian believers were headed if they bought into the false teaching. So Paul then presents his third negative consequence. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. And here it is. You have fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace. Bible scholar and Greek scholar William Mounts, in his translation, put it this way. You have cut yourself off from Christ. You have cut yourself off from Christ. Thus, you have fallen from grace. See, they were moving back into the land of the dead. And Paul now, seizing the moment, tells them in verse 5, or reminds them of the amazing grace they had in Christ. And he said this in verse 5, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves wait for the hope of righteousness. You see, the Galatians had received the grace of righteousness. Through what? Through the Spirit, by faith. Not by the flesh, not by the works of the law. Not by anything that they could do ever. You know, I love it here because Paul in our text is like a police dog who, who has tracked down the perp and with jaws firmly locked on will not let go until his handler gives the word heal. Paul is focused and determined to hold to the truth that Christ is all sufficient. For now he said here in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. There's no advantage, my friends, either way. Circumcision or uncircumcision will not gain you anything in the sight of God. There's not anything that you could do. You go to church every week the rest of your life. You'll get a lot of fruit out of it if you go for the right reason. But if you're trying to gain something in the sight of light, in the sight of God, like some brownie points, it ain't going to happen. See, the works of the flesh, my friends, count for nothing. So we have to ask the question, what does? What counts? What counts? Well, friends, take a look at this chapter. Read through it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us, in and through you, that will count for today and for eternity. We can go to Paul's first letter to Thessalonians, very beginning part of the letter when he does his introduction. He gives thanks to God for the Thessalonian believers for their what? Their work of faith and then their labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Well, back to our text, Paul is saying the same thing. What counts? What counts in the sight of God? Verse 6, only faith working through love. Only faith working through love. Well, as we begin now in verse 7, right through the 12, we find the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth negative consequence, one after the other. You can just follow through that on your own. And he begins here, Paul begins by pointing to the origin of the false teaching that had caused some to run their race poorly. And he asked them, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Verse 7. Because it certainly wasn't the one who called you. Verse 8. And like the police dog, Paul here continues, continues to hold on. Chew down hard. Chomp on hard. He won't let go. And he said, stop the spread of this false teaching. Verse 9. Stop it. And then Paul goes on to verse 10 and he says this positive affirmation. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. Now, did he have confidence in them? Possibly. But let's continue. Think about Paul's writings, or his letters in the, in the New Testament. He often used this metaphor of running, uh, running a race for his own life in Christ. And Paul, who was certain of the finished work of Christ in his own life, and knowing that even as an apostle of Christ, he had a, a way to go, he said this to the Philippian church, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call 
of God in Christ Jesus. And then further on down, he said this, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 17. And friends, this is the confidence that Paul had for the Galatians because he was sure that he, that is God, who began the good work in you will bring it to completion of the, at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. He was sure that God would accomplish what he began in the Galatians, what he began in him, what he began in you, and what he began in me so long ago. Well, here we are at verse 11. We just need a little bit of historical background as we deal with verse 11. We, we know from uh, Acts that the, the church uh, grew far and wide from those first days of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And along came the persecution with it. Now at the beginning of the church, the persecution would have come in more localized areas as the gospel moved from one place to the next place to the four corners of the Roman Empire. We can see this in the book of Acts. Uh, as the apostles began to preach the gospel, persecution came to them and others in many forms and from, and from a variety of places. So with this information in mind, we, we look at verse 11. And it seems here what Paul is saying here, it looks like the false teachers were also accusing Paul or accusing Paul of preaching circumcision. And what does Paul respond? He says, why am I still being persecuted then? You know, just take some time. Take some time and read uh, from chapter uh, 13 of Acts all the way to the end of the book, and you will find that Paul's gospel uh, message often brought much persecution to himself and others. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? Well, my friends, the cross is offensive. It's offensive. In the first century, the cross was an object of shame and death. But it was at the Roman cross, wasn't it, that Jesus was crucified for the sin of the world, as John 3.16 reminds us. Paul said to the church in Corinth, for the word of the cross is folly, folly, friends, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. First, uh, first uh, Corinthians 1.18. He would go on to say in that chapter, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And he summarizes this in 1 Corinthians 1.24. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So here's the point. Paul wasn't preaching circumcision. If he did, then the offense of the cross would have been removed. Verse 11. And he would no longer be persecuted. And isn't this so true today? Talk all you want about God, and most of the people that you talk to will be okay with that. Start talking about Jesus and the cross, and you can be sure to get plenty of resistance, and maybe even some outright anger towards you. Live your life in obedience to the Bible, and you will be persecuted in some way, shape, or form. And depending where you live geographically, it could include your very life. Well, back to Paul. When we read verse 12, when you read verse 12, it can certainly be a handful. Because yes, Paul was angry with the circumcision party when he said this, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. As Mounts translated the Greek, mutilate themselves. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? But let me ask you this. If you knew that someone was teaching your loved ones lies and trying to sell them on a worldview that will bring pain and death into their lives, what would you say or do to get your loved ones away from them? I want you to think about that. Well, this brings us right to verse 13. And here Paul said this, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. You were called to freedom. And let's talk about calling. Let me ask you this. Who is the one who does the calling here in verse 13? Who is the one that does the calling? Well, let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 15. And Jesus said this there at verse 16. Did you not 
you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So who does the calling? Jesus. And who does he call? Jesus does the calling, but who does he call? Paul said to the Thessalonian church, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 Who does Jesus call? You. He calls you. It says here in verse 13 that Jesus called you to freedom. Freedom to do what? To feed your fleshly desires? As we see here in verse 13. No. But, to, but through love to serve one another. But through love to serve one another. Verse 13. So here it is. Jesus has called you to a life of freedom. Lived in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. Not to use your freedom for your own gain. Or to use your freedom in Christ to hurt others. Verse 15. But to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled, it said here, Paul said here, all of it by loving and serving others. And my friends, yes, even loving your enemies. Because no person is exempt from the love of God. I just want to close by quoting from that article that, I had, that we had looked at earlier on. And a little, just let me read it to you. Quote, as the truly enlightened citizens of the kingdom... We get to marvel as God shines his light into darkness, into the darkness of lost hearts, just like he did our own. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness that you pour out into our lives. The Bible tells us every morning is a new opportunity to be blessed by you and to give you glory. And we thank you, Lord, for this message, this message that we, we, just, we can just trust you for our salvation, that you have accomplished all that we ever, ever need. There's nothing that we could have done, nothing that we can do uh, to earn your love, to uh, acquire things from you. No, you did it all, Lord. You did it all for us. Even while we were still running the other direction. No, no, you ran to us. And you offered love and forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that we understand that this love and forgiveness is not to be taken for granted. That we don't abuse it. That yes, there is a part that we do. And Jesus said that uh, if you love me, you will obey me. And pray, Lord, that we would do that. And when we fail, when we fall, when we don't, uh, we can come to you. And be honest with you and ask for forgiveness and you will give it to us. Because you've already forgiven all our sins, past, present, and future. We thank you so much, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day. God bless. Shalom.